Are you journeying through grief and needing a little extra support, inspiration, healing, and guidance? Join me in turning your losses into gains. Hi, my friend. I'm Tara Accardo, creator of the Losses Become Gains online community, blog, and now podcast. I'm an only child who lost both parents to cancer within six months of each other, followed by my sweet fur baby soon after. After all of this, I knew I was meant to do more with what I had been through. And now that means supporting and empowering grievers just like you. I'm a wife, friend, grieving daughter, writer, course creator, loss advocate turned grief coach, and I'm here to support you and move you through your grief. I want for you to feel like I'm your friend in the grief space and know that whatever you're going through, there's someone out there who just gets it. Few topics are off limits here because grief and loss don't hold back either. We'll get into the nitty gritty of what all of this means for you, some coping tools, lifestyle topics, and impactful mindset shifts to take you from just surviving to thriving after loss. So grab a cup of your favorite beverage, get comfortable, and show up with an open heart and mind. I'm so glad you're here. Hello, and welcome back to the Losses Become Gains podcast. I'm your host, Tara Ocardo, and we cover a lot of important topics on this podcast, ones that are really important, especially if you are journeying through grief, and even ones that can apply to your daily life, even if you are not a griever, even if you haven't recently or not recently experienced a devastating loss. And today, this is one of those topics. So in today's episode, we are talking about 10 ways to set boundaries after a loss and in our grief, especially. But again, this can really apply to anybody who is struggling with setting some boundaries today. So we're going to look at some best practices and more importantly, why it's so important to set boundaries. And it's not to be arm's length with people. It's not to show them the door. It's really to just protect our space, protect our heart, protect our soul. And in our fast-paced, highly interconnected world, I mean, now more than ever, right? Setting boundaries has become more important, but also sometimes harder than ever. Whether it's our personal or professional lives, establishing these really healthy, I'm going to say limits, but, you know, boundaries, helps us protect our mental and emotional well-being, as I mentioned. And especially in grief, when could that be more important than when we are emotionally taxed with grief after a loss, right? So your gain from today's episode is to learn why setting boundaries after a loss is so important. And you think you might know this already, but hang with me. And why it's so important to a successful healing journey and just our day-to-day happiness, honestly. And you're also going to learn some of my best practices and recommendations for doing exactly that. And now let me remind you too, boundaries are not selfish. Like when we sometimes think about putting boundaries up or whatever, it's kind of like I said before, some people kind of take that with a negative connotation or it's like we're putting walls up or whatever. That is not it at all, my friend. Boundaries are a form of self-care. They ensure that we respect ourselves and others while maintaining some semblance of sanity and joy or happiness or some semblance of this, whatever we can find in grief. Am I right? Okay. So let's explore this a little bit. Let's explore the importance of setting boundaries and deep dive a little bit into 10 effective ways to do so. So number one, Self-awareness. Self-awareness is key. You might be sitting here like, Tara, I d- hardly even know where my front door is to go outside. I, I am like the least self-aware person <laughs> right now. Again, maybe this is for those who are really in that acute grief stage who are really just struggling with a lot right now. But hear me out. Before you can effectively set boundaries, it's essential to understand your own needs, values, and limits, right? That's kind of a basic for being able to set boundaries. You got to be able to know those things in order to set them properly. So how can we do this? Number one, by taking time to reflect on what matters most to you. What drains your energy? What fuels your passion, right? Self-awareness forms the foundation for creating meaningful boundaries, 
And number two here, this is not always easy to come by. I want to preface it by saying that. And there's truly so much to a self-awareness practice and really getting a hold of this. So I don't want to kind of seem like I'm skipping over this point and, (laughs) you know, not communicating the importance of that and not communicating how hard a self-awareness practice can really be. It takes introspection. It takes a whole lot of patience and so much more. And while I'm just quickly on this topic, I would be remiss if I didn't mention my brand new intentional life after loss membership and community, because this is exactly what we do there together. And I know how intimidating setting boundaries and having a you know a presence practice and all of these things can feel when we are in the throes of grief. And in this membership and community, this is something we work on together to take the pressure off. Why? Why bother? Why do I do this? Why is this so important to me? Because one of the last things that we might feel when we're stuck in extreme pain and sadness is any semblance of introspection and patience, right? Really, self-awareness boils down to being able to bring ourselves back to the present moment. It's having the wherewithal to know what feels good and what doesn't, and how to then react if something does or doesn't serve us well in that moment. And, you know, try adding on emotional turmoil of grief onto that. And I know it sounds a bit out of reach sometimes, but I just want you to consider this today as you think about how you can better set boundaries for yourself. So one way that I love to do this, because especially as grievers, if we are being asked a lot of questions or we have to make a lot of decisions, which we often have to, especially in early days, like, or God forbid, if you're like planning a funeral or something, you sometimes cannot handle like open-ended questions, right? Like sometimes all you can muster is a yes or no response. So if someone's there trying to ask you like, hey, what are you in the mood for for dinner? You might be like, I don't even want to eat. Like don't even talk to me right now, right? So really, these are the kinds of questions that we also need to ask ourselves. So it can be something as simple as, does this feel right to me right now? Yes or no? Does this feel good in my gut, right? This is a perfect practice for gut checking yourself and getting in touch with your intuition and just have grace with yourself throughout all of this. Because whether you're trying to set boundaries or not, this is like key in proper grief work. And I know I just mentioned my membership and community. I'll just mention all of that is linked in the show notes if you are curious about that or are needing help because I promise you like this is what we dig into with that. But again, as I said in the beginning, to even be able to set your boundaries, you got to know your limits, right? So that's why this checking in with yourself and this self-awareness practice is so important. All right, number 2 communicate openly. So important, guys. Clear and honest communication is fundamental to boundary setting. Be open about your feelings, needs, expectations, whatever it is with those around you. I know how uncomfortable this can be. Y'all, I pride myself on being a good communicator. I would consider this one of my strengths, but this can be hard, especially If you are not a confrontational person, which I don't consider myself to be, right? Like who wants to go there with people sometimes? I know. Whether it's just an uncomfortable conversation, not wanting to hurt people, not wanting to even go there, you know what I mean? Like sometimes you just don't have the mental or emotional capacity to go there with somebody. I want to acknowledge that. But being fearful too of how they might react to what you have to say. Okay. This is all super valid. Wherever you're at on the spectrum, I want you to know that I see you, but let me tell you, it's also super empowering when we do. I want you to remember that because we're stepping into our own voice and sense of self when we do this. And this is an extremely powerful and amazing thing to be able to do. And not many people can do this effectively, you know, and this is one of those weird twisted gifts that grief kind of gives us. It allows us to 
just be able to reflect and understand what's important, what's important to us and how we can look out for those around us too. And, you know, being open and honest is not always pretty. And as always, I would recommend doing this as tastefully, respectfully, as maturely as possible. Trust me, I know when you are in those early stages of grief, pretty much anything can set us off, like (laughs) been there. But think about it this way. No one can really argue with how you feel, right? Someone might try to. Someone, there are insensitive people out there that might be like, you're not feeling this way. You're just being irrational, whatever. Ignore that. That is completely a reflection on them and their beliefs. That is a them problem. That is not a you problem. No one can tell you that you do or don't feel a certain way or that you should. We are living our own lives here. We are our own people. We are not living the lives of other people, right? Our truth is right in here. And if you're not watching on YouTube, I'm pointing to my heart right now. <laughs> so that being said, constructive feedback is a beautiful thing. And it's something like me personally, I've learned to embrace it in my personal life and my professional life because who doesn't want to be better? So we're, we're human, right? Sometimes we miss things. Sometimes we miss how we might be coming off to somebody or vice versa. So being able to both give and receive that is fundamental to becoming a better human being and growth in our grief and encouraging others to do the same and to not be afraid of their thoughts, right? Because just as we have our thoughts and feelings, they have theirs. And why why is this so important? Because it paves the way for healthier relationships and just mutual respect and understanding for each other. When You can both kind of let it out in a healthy way with these like I feel statements instead of, you know, you do this or you do that, which can end up coming off very accusatory. We're all better off, right? So listen, some people, they might do that to you. Don't stoop to their level, right? Don't be that person. Come at it with love, respect, understanding, There's so much growth to be had in these conversations, so they're nothing to veer away from. In fact, I encourage you to have them and just own it, right? And I promise you in probably 99.9% of the situations you might find yourself in here, people are going to be like, wow, I didn't realize that. I'm so sorry. Or they're just, they're going to hear you and see you in a different way, especially when you approach it again with love and humility and just, hey, I'm just laying it all out on the table here. Human to human, this is how I'm feeling. No one can fault you for that, right? Number three, say no when necessary or when it does not feel aligned to you. This is going to be a shorter point here, but this is a really impactful one. Learning to say no is one of the most powerful boundary setting tools that we have, especially in grief. It's okay to decline invitations, requests from people, or tasks that just don't align with your priorities or emotional or mental capacity. Now, listen, of course, we have families. We might have kids. We might have a job. This is outside of all of those responsibilities. I know we can't get away from everything, right? But I spoke more at length about this in episode 24 as well, so definitely go check that out. But saying no respectfully, kind of like the last point I was just talking about, it asserts your boundaries and respects your time. That is the the goal of communicating that, right? In grief especially, boundaries are more important than ever to help keep us sane and grounded and well-balanced emotionally. So simply put, own your boundaries loud and proud. It's okay. (laughs) And listen, there are going to be some people who might not respond well. They might guilt trip you, whatever. (sighs) Take a deep breath and let it go. You are one person and you can't please everyone and you can't be everything to everyone. Remember that. Next point here is to set clear expectations. Establishing clear expectations with others helps prevent any misunderstandings and potential conflicts or whatever could arise. Similar to the point on good communication we were talking about, expectations are a big part of the strategy. 
This means being specific about your needs and your limits. And when others know what you expect, they are more likely to respect your boundaries. It's pretty simple. (laughs) Now, does everyone make this easy on us sometimes? Absolutely not. (laughs) Grief or not, we are tested with our boundaries and expectations constantly. And when we're grieving, we're often a little more on edge with our emotions, which can make us a little more easily frustrated, right? When expectations aren't met. We have to be realistic with our expectations though, but all the more reason to communicate and to communicate well, which trust me, I know. I remember those early days of grief. That can take a lot out of us sometimes. We might not know the best way to communicate what we want or need. We might not even know what we want or need, okay? I know that feeling. You just got to do your best here. And I'd be remiss if I didn't say this here also, but you cannot expect yourself from other people. I have an entire blog post actually on this topic, on coping with unmet expectations, which I really hope you check out. I'll put it in the show notes if this is something that you're struggling with, because it's hard. It really is. But we need to remember that we can all be raised differently. We are taught to cope with grief and loss differently. We are all products of our surroundings and education and who we were raised by, all the things. Just because you would or wouldn't do something one way doesn't mean we can necessarily expect that behavior from another person, no matter how basic it seems sometimes, just basic decency, right? So just something to keep in mind today. All right, number five, we're halfway there. Prioritize self-care. Oh, (laughs) self-care. This is a big topic with a lot of intricacies, so I won't get into crazy amounts of detail here, but let me say this. Self-care isn't selfish. Guys, it's necessary. Make time for activities that nourish your body and your mind and your soul because by prioritizing self-care, you send a strong message that your well-being matters. You send that to yourself. You send that to other people. And I'm telling you, when we start prioritizing ourselves and our self-care, so whether that is like a a bath with some lavender that's just spa-like that you take maybe two or three times a week, or you have like this certain time of night where you watch your favorite show or you read or whatever it is, you do your meditation every morning, a gratitude practice, whatever this looks like for you. The more you do that and the more that you demand that time of yourself and that other people respect it, your brain starts to take that on. You become the person that you want to be. This is something, again, that we, we get into in my membership. This is where I help you get to this point is shifting that mindset. And by shifting your mindset, you shift and transform your entire life. It's pretty freaking amazing, actually, (laughs) the transformations that we're all capable of, even after devastating loss. So again, with self-care, I know it's a big topic here. Remember, there is an entire self-care and wellness section on the blog on my website where there are more topics like this. So once again, that is linked in the show notes here too, if you want to check it out, if self-care is just something that you feel you're kind of neglecting right now. All right, so number six, this is one you may or may not see coming, but identify toxic relationships. So this is a big one, like really big. Like this is a really big, important one. (laughs) Recognizing toxic or unhealthy relationships is crucial with boundary setting. If someone is consistently disrespecting your boundaries or belittles you, drains your energy, Simply put, consider distancing yourself, perhaps surround yourself with people who respect and support your boundaries. That is like my main message to you today. And I hope you feel empowered to do that. Again, it's like our communication point we were talking about earlier. I know this can be hard. Just to give a quick personal example here, I unfortunately have had some personal experience with this without going into vast detail or naming names because that's none of that is really important. This episode isn't about me. But I'll just mention, this has happened on a few occasions in different contexts over the last few years. I had 
a couple of people who would call me um, or actually demand that I call them actually. Literally when my mom was on her way to dying and I would be at the hospital visiting her and they kind of knew like roughly what time I would end visiting or they would like be trying to like Facebook message me or something. These are ultimately friends of my mom's and they would want to talk to me as I'm driving home from visiting my mom in the hospital, which let me tell you, that is something. I mean, if you've ever had a family member in the hospital or a nursing home or hospice, whatever it is, you sometimes just, you need that drive sometimes to just to decompress and process everything you just saw and witnessed and just went through, right? But these friends of hers, <laughs> these family friends, they would call me or again, demand that I call them and they would be lamenting about how sad they were about my mom's condition. I can appreciate that. But in no time, the entire call was about them. And not that I needed the call to be about me, but here's the difference. It was about how horrible their life was, how they were struggling with this or that. They got completely off topic. Let's be clear. It's not that I wasn't empathetic or I didn't feel badly about anything that was going on in their life, right? But bedside manner here, like, hello, my mom is dying. She is weeks from death. She was in the hospital for over a month and a half, and it was this constant back and forth. Just pretty inconsiderate and pretty tone deaf, right? There is a time and a place for things like that and bombarding someone when they have just had a very emotionally draining visit with their mom or whoever it was in the hospital, that ain't it. And they're not there, right? They're not experiencing the things that we are sometimes. So that is important to remember, not to let them off the hook, but just to remember that they're in their bubble, but we're very much in ours too. And that is where these boundaries come in, my friend. That is why this has to be respected. And this is why this is such an important topic. And in another instance, and this was actually after both of my parents died, this was as my husband and I were going through the wedding planning process. And long story short, I essentially lost a friend during that process um, one I've known for a very long time. Uh, I actually talk a little bit more about this um, to be v- very fully transparent in episode 16 of the podcast. So that episode is coping with the wedding process without a loved one. So if you or anybody you know is journeying through that process or will at some point, definitely check that out. That's that's a whole nother can of worms. But basically, I was ghosted, very much ghosted by a would have been bridesmaid on multiple occasions, pretty, pretty badly, pretty severely on a couple of occasions. And so ghosted to the point where I was literally two days away from leaving for Italy, where my husband and I were supposed to go. We had our second ceremony there. We were going there a few days early. I still didn't know if she was coming. She literally was not responding to me. And I had to contact one of her family members to find out if she was coming or not. And they told me she wasn't, made a lot of excuses for them. I've never heard from them or seen them since then. No explanation, no apology, no closure, nothing. So why do I bring this up? It was a little bit part of my grief journey, and I'll be honest, actually not a little bit. It was a secondary loss kind of, if you will. It was something that I had to grieve. So why do I bring up this particular situation? Because this wasn't necessarily around when my parents were dying, right? I bring this up because it's a perfect like, kind of daily life example of a situation where we might have to set a boundary with somebody, and we have to take a step back and realize our self-worth. And let me tell you, I grieved that friendship. I I still might be grieving it a little bit. It's still kind of shocking some days. I don't even totally know where I stand with this person. It's very surreal. It's very strange. (laughs) And, you know, listen, on one hand, 
no one really owes us anything in life, right? I could almost like let that go. I'm I'm no like queen of a country over here, okay? I'm not a horribly demanding person. But it was truly just the lack of communication and respect for our friendship and for boundaries that was so devastating. And so after this situation, after not hearing from them, after not getting any kind of acknowledgement, I had to make a choice. I personally felt like I had been burned too badly by these various people, this this friend I had, but then also these family friends that made my life a living hell. (laughs) And I got to a point where I was moving into a new phase of life. I was certainly trying to, right? I was newly married. As of this recording, I'm, you know, halfway through my pregnancy, I'm going to be a mom. And so there are, but again, listen, it, you don't have to go through any major life changes to set boundaries with people. And I'm not saying you have to cut them out, but it's just evaluating these relationships that perhaps aren't serving us or our highest good. They're not bringing out the best in us. And then we can't really bring out the best in them. So it's kind of like, what is the the energy exchange here? This, this is a very low vibrational energy relationship. I need, to, I need to take a step back and think about this. So if we're trying to move forward, if we're trying to move into sort of this newer, healthier phase of life with a new mindset, for me personally, I realized I couldn't bring these relationships with me. So in my own way, I, I kind of shut it down or I just kind of slowly moved away, didn't contact, and eventually I found some peace with that. So think about how this could apply in your own life and how you might want to make a shift if this is relevant to you. All right. So next on the list here is create physical boundaries. So we've talked a lot about sort of like these mental boundaries, but physical boundaries are really important too. So what do I mean by this? In this digital age (laughs) that we're in, especially, it is easy, it is very easy to blur the lines between work and personal life. Perhaps we get calls or texts after hours. Perhaps we find ourselves checking our email a little bit when we should really be enjoying time with our family or, you know, just being present and engaged with life. I can't stress this enough. Create physical boundaries by designating specific spaces for work, for relaxation, and family time, and even like certain times of day if you need to. If you are like more of a a little more type A or a little more like you need to kind of plan this out in a planner from like, okay, nine to five, that is it. That is my work time. 501 onwards, I am focusing on something else. I empower and encourage you to do that. I keep bringing up work, but especially if you work from home, like I do personally, your office space where you relax and hang out with family, where you sleep, that could all be in some pretty close quarters, right? So setting these healthy physical boundaries helps maintain a healthy work-life balance, which we all need, right? But even if you are going into an office, just, you know, again, apply this to your own life, however is relevant to you. Even if you have to do a little practice in presence, and remember, I have a free uh, toolkit on my website to help you with this if you need it. I'll link it here in the show notes too. But as you shift from room to room, let's see, whether or not you're even working from home, let's just say you just got a lot going on and you just feel like it's all, all the lines are blurring, right? As you shift from room to room or as you shift from task to task, find some presence there. Think about how much you're carrying with you into each phase of your day and make sure that you are thoughtful and intentional with this. All right, number eight, manage your time. Time management is a really important aspect of setting boundaries. Using tools like a calendar, whether this is like a good old fashioned paper one, I love a good old fashioned paper or kind of like notebook to calendar or planner whether you're using it on your phone, whether you have a to-do list, an an app, whatever works for you. Allocate your time wisely. 
prioritize tasks that align with your goals and your values and just what your literal priorities are that day. And learn to delegate or say no to excessive commitments, things that you maybe don't really have to do that day or things you don't maybe really need to go to. You have to be kind of picky, picky choosy here, (laughs) especially in grief. Why is managing our time and getting organized important? Because it gives us a sense of control at a time when we can feel very out of control, when our life feels very out of control. What getting organized and managing our time does is it takes all of the craziness and chaos from our heads, everything that might distract us from our grief, and it puts it down in a place where we can really see it and manage it. This allows us to take a step back, look at our list in whatever form you have one, and think about what we really need to get done, what really needs to happen first to figure out what has to get done that day, by who, at what time, and then from there, what can truly wait. And remember, it is all about being as realistic as possible and giving ourselves grace if something just doesn't get done, right? We might have our daily priorities. We have to eat. We have to make sure we're drinking water. Maybe you have a dog that has to go out. You might have kids that have to be fed, right? These are some of the bare minimums, but if there's anything on your list that can either be put off just one more day (laughs) to give yourself just a little time to breathe and a little patience, or if there is something that you can recruit the help of someone else to do, I empower you to do that. I promise you, you will feel so much better. All right. Number nine, we're getting towards the end here. Practice self-compassion. I hope this goes without saying, but as grievers, we need to hear this as often as possible, I think. Setting boundaries can be challenging, and you may encounter some resistance from others or even from yourself. Maybe it's a little bit of discomfort in the beginning, whatever this looks like for you. Be kind to yourself during this process. Understand that boundary setting is an ongoing practice. It's kind of an art almost in a way, (laughs) seriously. And it's okay to make mistakes along the way, all right? Also understand that this is all going to take some time. Your grief is going to take time. Finding the kind of skill and ability to set these boundaries, it takes time. So give yourself grace as you venture through it. I know you've probably heard of the saying, time heals all wounds. Okay, that is not what I'm saying here (laughs) because we can't just stick that on our grief and call it a day and expect that to work, right? There are a lot of complexities to experiencing a loss, but time is a factor in some ways. But I want you to remember time alone won't heal us. Time alone and just biding your time, hoping that you're going to feel better. It's not going to cut the mustard. It is everything that we've talked about in this episode so far and so much more that is going to help take you from really just existing and just dealing with your grief to really living and thriving in it. And it's all about those baby steps that will move you forward. So number 10 here, I'd be remiss if I left this out. Seek support. Don't be afraid to seek support from friends, family, a therapist, counselor, hi, grief coach over here. They can offer you guidance and encouragement and a safe space to discuss your boundary setting journey. By this, I really mean a professional, if that is helpful for you. Sometimes with our friends and family, there can be a lot of bias there. Maybe the ones, they're the ones that you are struggling with, (laughs) with some of these boundaries. But I want you to remember, and this is why seeking help is so important, setting boundaries is an essential, essential aspect of grief that is a critical component to protect your mental and emotional health, as I mentioned in the beginning of this episode. So being able to work with somebody or just get connected with a community where there's people that understand where you are and what you're going through and learning how they might have navigated something like this can truly be so helpful and so healthy to be surrounded by on a daily basis. And 
just remember that boundary setting is a continuous process and it can be very hard to do. I am not here to sugarcoat it today, but with practice, it becomes a really empowering tool for a happier, more balanced life. And if you walk away with anything today, I hope it's that. I hope it's that you feel empowered to set those boundaries if you need to in whatever way feels organic and right and aligned to you. So that all being said, if you are looking for more help, I mentioned my brand new membership and community earlier. I really just want to hammer this home because whether it's boundaries that you're struggling with or any other aspect of your grief, I purposefully created this membership and community for those that are seeking that kind of support and guidance and just help (laughs) day-to-day life of navigating grief and loss. And this could be right up your alley. So this membership, just so you know, it's designed to take you, like I was saying, from just living and just barely hanging on and surviving in your grief after the death of a loved one specifically to living and thriving again. And I know that if you are even having trouble setting boundaries, that might feel like a lot but here's why this is so important. This membership brings you valuable, super valuable coping tools, the guidance of a grief coach and a community. More importantly, I've been talking about community a lot today, but it will support you as you heal, as you cope, as you elevate your life and your soul and design your most intentional life after suffering a loss. It's why I named it what I did. And it's with an uplifting support system that you can count on. And there's people out there that are going through something really similar to you. And again, if you are in the early stages of grief right now, this might feel daunting. This might feel overwhelming. I hear you. It is not about just getting over it and moving on. It is about trusting yourself. And it is about trusting the process and growing around your grief and giving yourself grace as you move forward and as you do that and being able to have people around you that you can ask these questions to and be like, raise your hand and be like, hey, this is what I'm feeling. This is what I'm experiencing. (laughs) Anyone else? Because I promise you there are people in a very similar boat to you. And it really comes down to acknowledging that your loss will always be with you. But you're doing so in a way that is really easy to digest. This membership has tools and resources for you that is so easy to just take at whatever pace you need because it's all about the baby steps. It is in a way that is not too daunting or too much too fast. So I just want to reassure you of that because it's really just it's building around your pain right? It's not that you're trying to fill in this hole that the person or people that you've lost have now left, but it's it's supporting yourself on this long, crazy journey of grief with a sense of community alongside the perfect tools to help you. So with that all being said, that is all I have for you today, my friend. And I hope these very high level 10 ways to take care of yourself and set some much needed boundaries, both in and out of grief, were helpful today. And if you like what you heard or are loving the podcast so far, I would truly, truly appreciate a review or a rating on whatever platform you're listening. This really helps me to be able to bring even more griefy content and support and guidance to others who need it just like you. Remember, you have got this. You are so capable of setting these much needed boundaries if you haven't already. I believe in you. I am here for you. And I just hope you have a fabulous day and I will see you in the next episode. I am sending you a huge thank you for tuning into today's episode, my friend. I'm so grateful you're here and for the steps that you're taking to heal your heart, open your mind, fulfill your soul, to learn, grow, and evolve, and move through this crazy thing called life in big, beautiful, impactful ways. Visit lossesbecomegains.com for my blog and for more coping tools. Explore my Grief Becomes Gains online course if you need some extra grief support and coaching. And be sure you're following along on Instagram and Facebook at Losses Become Gains Podcast. I love seeing new faces, meeting new people, hearing your story, and supporting you however I can. And remember to always keep asking yourself, 
How will I turn my losses into gains today? I'll catch you in the next episode.